I stand here as actually a farmer first, um, a cheesemaker second, and um, a director with a lot of debt. So um, bear with me if I uh, uh, talk more about farming than uh, economics. A Meredith Dairy is a um, alternative agricultural system. Meredith is uh, a little town just on the outs <coughs> excuse me on the outskirts of um, or between Ballarat and Geelong. So we're just an hour and a half uh, west of Melbourne in Victoria. Um, my, my presentation's in three parts. I'm going to talk about sheep and goat dairying across the world, and then uh, talk a bit about the Meredith Dairy story, and I'll, and then I'll run um, past the uh, export story. So sheep and goats are in fact the oldest of all domesticated production animals and there are actually more sheep and goats milked in the world than there are cows. Sheep and goats were actually milked um, on farms for food production before cows were even domesticated. 2% of cheese consumed in the developed world is actually cheese and dairy products made from non-cow's milk. And in the developing world, um, there's uh, about a 30% consumption of milk other than cow's milk. There's approximately 950 million goats in the world, and most of those goats are actually in Africa and Asia, so I was quite surprised by that. Europeans, particularly the French, are famous for their sheep and goat products, as you probably well know, and France has a very mature industry with 2.4 five million dairy sheep and dairy goats. The French goat milk production is actually in billion litres. So if you convert that into Aussie dollars, that's about a billion Australian dollars. The French animals produce on average about a thousand litres per lactation and a lactation goes for about 300 days. And since the 1950s, the French have developed cooperative breeding programs and with genetic improvement have been able to lift their production by as much as 40%. This is um, <coughs> uh, the, probably the most famous dairy goat um, breed in the world. It is um, a Swiss breed called a Sarnen. And uh, you'll see Sarnens in all um, countries uh, where a, a dairy industry is um, growing. Um, they're high producers, they have a lovely temperament, um, uh, they're quite robust um, and, uh, 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 and in this case uh, they are pasture fed but they also lend themselves to be uh, in a housing situation. This looks almost biblical, this slide, but I took this just two years ago. It's um, uh, in northern Greece, uh, the young lad who's a shepherd is, was possibly an illegal immigrant into, in Greece. And the breed is uh, Chios, and this is a sheep animal, and the milk goes to make uh, true Greek feta. Uh, this is uh, the sarn and goat, and this is in an um, intensive uh, farming system in the Netherlands. The Netherlands have become the second biggest producers of uh, goat milk outside of France in the European system. Um, these girls are probably fairly either pregnant or, or heavily in lactation. And of course then you've got the other spectrum with traditional farming, uh, of course this is in Africa. Uh, and in Africa you'll find dual purpose uh, goats and dual purpose sheep. Uh, this goat is probably um, a meat a breed that's also producing milk. And uh, they tend to be uh, to adapt to their climatic conditions. You can see the, the long ears. It's possibly because of the climate, uh, quite a hot climate. And then you go back to the intensive agricultural system again. Uh, this slide was taken in, in Holland. It's a 180 heads uh, milking stall, uh, rotary dairy, uh, incredibly intensive. I mean, 4,000 goats being milked. So now we go into the Australian situation. Um, it's really hard to get accurate data because um, everybody who's milking sheep and goats are actually competitors because we're all trying to sell into the Australian domestic market, which is actually quite small. But in Victoria alone, there are 31 dairy licences uh, for dairy enterprises that don't milk cows. 
the largest commercial scaled up uh, dairies for sheep and goats started and emerging about 25 years ago. And of course, they were previously a cottage industry. Australia probably has the most expensive milk in the world, even though um, uh, I, I believe that Norway might actually be even um, beating us on price because of uh, huge subsidies in Norway. But in Australia, our milk our, for goat milk sells for about $1.20 to $1.50, and for sheep's milk is as much as $2. In the US, it's about $1.25 a litre, in France, 90 cents. About a third of the licences uh, for sheep and goat dairying in Australia have a vertically ent uh, integrated enterprise, so making their own products uh, and selling it domestically. It's been a fairly relative slow take up by most uh, sheep and goat uh, farms in Australia, but there are some genetic improvement programs um, and some producers have made some significant um, production gains by using artificial breeding and measuring production. The commercial Australian goat produces about 25% less than the uh, commercial goat in France. There's new genomic technologies being employed, um, particularly by my, uh, my company, and we um, expect further production improvements by as much as 20%. There are just two main players in the goat dairy industry in Australia, and, uh, and um, Meredith Dairy is one of those, and we account for nearly 50% of the industry. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Meredith Dairy story. So Meredith Dairy is uh, 26, in its 26th year, um, in um, 1990, uh, about Christmas time, we went home to the family farm to be wool growers. And then in February 1991, all hell hit loose with the, um, the abolition of the uh, floor price for wool. Um, 4.7 million bales of wool were in stockpile. Sheep values collapsed. There was record interest rates. We were paying 22% for farmland loans. And of course, our treasurer was telling us that we were a banana republic and a, in a recession we had to have. So things were pretty tough for farmers in Australia in, in the early 90s. In about 1991, this article came out from the Fairfax Media, from the Age newspaper. It's written by John Legg. It was written on the 20th of January, 1991. The cartoon is um, illustrated by Spooner, and, you can, uh, and uh, it symbolises a um, big fish eating a little fish and the level playing field. And uh, it's, it's quite amusing. There's uh, an Aussie rules playing field there. The um, opening paragraph reads, and I quote, Australia is going to be a loser unless there is a move from a commodity exports to innovation and consumer services. John Legg, uh, in this article, compares the price of wheat over 160 years, not in the dollar value, but in what can be purchased with labour hours. So, um, in the early 1900s, a farm labourer would have to work some 300 days to earn enough money to buy a tonne of wheat. In 1991, when this article was written, a tonne of wheat cost about $160, and a farm labourer at the time on about $100 a day only needed to work for one and a half days to be able to buy a tonne of wheat. So John Legg um, calculated that the price of wheat, therefore, had fallen by 200 times. This long decline in the effective price of wheat illustrates the power of the free commodity market. Costs and prices are forced down. Therefore, for farmers to maintain incomes, they needed to get more and more and more productive and reduce costs. And last week in the Age newspaper, I read that um, ASW wheat sold for $160 a tonne. So we're still getting the same price for wheat 26 years later. So after we read this, we decided we needed to change what we were doing. We needed to innovate. Um, innovation is about doing things in a different way. We needed to control our prices for farm produce. We could no longer rely on the auction system. 
And at the same time, we had a chance meeting with a cheesemaker who told us the best cheese in the world is actually made from sheep's milk. And we had the sheep. So 26 um, years down the track, Meredith Dairy, as, um, as first introduced, it's a vertically uh, integrated enterprise. We have 110 staff. Um, we have an annual growth of um, 10 to 25%. This year it's 20% growth. We've been able to expand our farm from a 500 hectare property to 1,600 hectares today. We've developed a genetic improvement program and uh, last year we started DNA parentage and analysis and genomics studies. We never stopped milking. Um, despite sheep and goat being quite seasonal. Um, and that is in fact one of our points of difference because right across the rest of the world, sheep and goats are only milked in a seasonal way. We, never, uh, we milk seven days a week and 365 days of the year. We've got quality management systems, which include obviously a QA program, but also we have an ERP financial system standard operating procedures, um, <coughs> which are all documented, animal production programs, uh, electronic ID on all animals, and uh, automatic uh, data recording. We export, um, we have an export accredited facility, uh, and that, uh, the a manufacturing facility runs um, seven days a week. The main thing is we've been able to maintain our margin and that was with a consumer pool rather than producing products uh, in a commodity way. We purchased a logistics centre in 2015 on the outskirts of Melbourne and this has facilitated infantry control, pick and packs, cold storage, etc. But our mission um, really is to maintain margin, to ensure return on investment and um, to maintain our enterprise in the most sustainable way possible. I'll just go through a bit of a slideshow, a bit like Granny coming back from the holiday, but it's just um, a slideshow of some of the activities on the farm. This is our milking sheep. Uh, we've now registered this breed as, and called it the Australian milking sheep. Um, they've got uh, white, they're, they're a white wool, so there's no stress for the merino industry, there's no black tips. They have really good... Uh, feed confirmation, so they lend themselves to pasture feeding. The dairy goats are actually um, are two forms of farming, but when in high production and also in the winter time, they are shedded or housed, and they are fed a total TMR. And uh, uh, this uh, feed, uh, this, oh, if I can get it right, that's ah, not going to work, but the um, sort of like a muesli that we feed them. We also do some grazing, but we only graze when there's really high feed values um, and dry goats or um, pregnant goats not being milked. We've got about 9,000 goats. This was taken in 2009. We could no longer get the photo like this because we've now separated the goats up into small individual farm lots. And um, we've got a 3,000 dairy sheep. But the, um, those numbers, the 9,000 goats and the 3,000 sheep, include dry sheep, pregnant sheep, not in milk, and also young uh, animals. We've got uh, four milking enterprises, all on the one main farm. One of those is a sheep dairy and three goat dairies. Each of the enterprises um, has its own infrastructure, uh, has its own staff, has its own plant and equipment and runs independently of the main centre of the farm. The dairies we use are 36 uh, side herringbone design. This one is actually a double up dairy and it has the capacity to milk 400 animals in an hour with one labour unit. Each of the dairies are fitted with electronic ID. We have electronic milk meters, electronic recording, and all sorts of automation, which includes cut removers, auto drafting, and uh, uh, also we have detection uh, for animals that should not be being milked. The cups don't actually work on those animals if they happen to walk into the dairy. 
We also have, uh, this is just taken from the cheese factory. This is a small pasteuriser we use for yogurt production. Um, goat's milk lends itself to um, a form of cheese making process called lactic curd fermentation, unlike cow's milk, which is more, lends itself to rendered curd fermentation. Uh, these are just two of uh, six maturation tanks we use for goat's milk. This is like the nursery rhyme, Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, but that's the curd. Uh, and uh, the, the solid part of milk and the liquid part is removed and we make our products from the, from the curd. This is just uh, one of our three manufacturing rooms and down the bottom is our distribution centre on the outskirts of Laverton. So we're uh, packing here um, marinated goat's cheese. So these are the products that we make and uh, just um, I was lying in bed last night and thinking what's innovative about our products? Well, um, I guess it's sheep and goat's milk, it's not cow's milk, that's innovative enough. But the, um, the, this product here, which possibly most of you, you know, it's widely available in Australia and available in uh, all of the supermarkets and, and food chains. But it's, when I think about it, it's actually fairly innovative. It's, um, uh, it's a unique packaging. It's got new t unique texture, new unique flavours, and it's, it's made compl completely of Australian product ingredients. So Meredith Dairy in the market, 90% of our products are sold domestically. We've got, like I said before, 10 to 20% growth, 60% retail and 40% other. We do export. It's not um, a big part of our um, marketing but we export to countries um, where we have representatives, so that's export direct, but we use consolidators to export to countries where we don't have representation through uh, various consolidating businesses. So now I'm going to talk about our export. You know, I see 2013. Before 2013, we had quite a, a lovely little business going on in China. The uh, high-end chefs uh, could not get fresh goat's milk from Europe in the European autumn. But the European autumn, of course, is our spring. So we, um, we were actually uh, had a fantastic business going on uh, in the springtime, which really helped us because that's when we had most of our milk. Uh, the other thing post uh, pre-2013 was sheep and goat uh, was a non-prescribed good, which meant we could send sheep and goat anywhere in the world without an export licence. But uh, that's soon changed with the, um, in China, for example, with the health scare with the melamine in the infant milk powder and the death of some infants. Uh, China, the, the Chinese FDA really brought in lots and lots of changes, including requirements of strict accreditation. So post-2013, um, I hope there's no one here from China, but anyway, um, the Chinese FDA have become incredibly unpredictable. And uh, uh, we find lots and lots and lots of what I call non-tariff barriers. Uh, incredibly bureaucratic and uh, the paperwork that's required is really quite extraordinary. The go Chinese government also have uh, built and own uh, their own testing laboratories. So each batch of product uh, going into China needs a nutritional panel and that batch must reflect exactly what uh, the nutrition is in that product uh, by the label. Um, and uh, if you get rejected, your product become, comes off a, uh, off a register and it takes 18 months to two years to get the product back on the register. There's also requirements for cold chain control. So an importer needs to control cold chain for a perishable product not just from Australia to the customs in China, on the China border, but from Australia through to the retailer within the Chinese borders. So it's pretty difficult to, uh, at the moment for us and other dairy, the cow dairy industry as well, to get product into China. But there's enormous potential, and I've written down there, that Chinese perceive goat's milk to be healthier than cow's milk. So there's a real wake-up call there for people in the cow dairy industry. Australians' uh, products are very trustworthy. They, they, they know our, uh, the, the Chinese community know that Australian food is safe, unlike their own food. 
there's a growing middle class and it's expected that within five years China will have 40% of their population in the middle class and they want to eat dairy. The free trade agreement is working on our behalf. At the moment we're paying 12% tariff but that will be zero in the next five years. So that should work really well for us. And the other thing is the Chinese really want to invest in dairy goats, both in their own country and in Australia. I'll talk about the USA. Uh, oh no, before I do that, I just want to show you this slide. I, it's, this is just gorgeous. I took this uh, in a supermarket in China. I don't, it is actually a cow milk product, but it just shows you the love the Chinese have for Australian dairy products. <laughs> So the Meredith Dairy uh, business in USA, it's, so this is uh, as of last year, um, minimum tariff barriers, unlike what we're finding with the Chinese market. And um, our product is really at the high end of um, the, the, uh, the degrees of quality when it comes to sheep and goat milk products in the US. The US FDA actually accepts Australian accreditation. It accepts our labelling, it accepts the rules that we um, have as part of our accreditation here in Australia for export licensing. Um, it's, it's expensive to establish in uh, the USA and it's a very competitive market because there's lots of Europeans. Products over there, but the opportunities are also good and the Aussie dollar has helped as long as it stays below um, 80 cents. The free trade agreement, we're currently paying 3% tariff, but that's reducing by half a percent per year. So within a few years, that will be zero. The other thing is the USA uh, sheep and goat dairy industry is, is not at all sophisticated. There's no innovation happening. Uh, so there's lots of openings there. And the USA products are of a really poor quality. And I said before how uh, Meredith Dairy, we're milking all year round, despite the animals being very seasonal. In the United States, they only milk seasonally and they freeze their milk and freeze their curd. So, you know, how can you make good cheese out of that? And the big population, of course, and they know they're, um, they're they have a really good uh, palate for dairy. So just to finish, this is my last slide. Um, there's no, uh, there's, within the challenges of sheep and goat dairy in Australia, the main thing is there's absolutely no protocol to allow for imported genetics from uh, countries where there are great genetics, like France. So that's a real barrier for our improvement. Gene sequestration costs about $50 an animal. So when you've got 9,000 goats, that's a lot of money. Sheep and goat dairying is fairly capital intensive and value adding um, and setting up vertical integration is, is incredibly difficult. Um, we have uh, lots of challenges with maintaining the value of our brand and, uh, and keeping our margins so that we get return on investment. But probably the most challenging thing for us is matching the milk production with our sales. Uh, an unexpected lift in milk means we have to go out and really push sales and vice versa. An unexpected drop in milk production means we're putting the brakes on. And that puts an enormous amount of strain on both management and our finances and our sales and marketing team. And that's it, thank you.